You are listening to the Dave Sweetmore Show. It's an absolute pleasure to say joining me today on the show is the front man and founding member of the Nightingales, Robert Lloyd. Yes, Robert, how are you doing? I'm all right, Dave. How are you? Yeah, really good. Listen, thanks for taking the time out to join us today. Let's talk about your career. You've had a pretty active career in music. Uh, last year, you should have been on a tour that was pretty much sold out. It couldn't happen because of the pandemic. How did you find yourself keeping busy during the pandemic? Well, it was difficult for the band because we've got... Uh... Um, a German bass player so we couldn't get together um, to, to rehearse or anything I mean it, you know even in the times when when we weren't locked down we couldn't get together as a full band me personally I just um, I don't go out much anyway so <laughs> it weren't like a major uh, major aggravation really Was it weird being out of the music world though for such a long period of time? Um, I don't know because we do it in you know we kind of release a record and do a tour or whatever and then there's there tends to be months off anyway. We're not like, um, you know, sort of Iron Maiden or someone who's going around the world for, for you know, 12 months at a time. It was it was frustrating. The, lot, the main thing was because we got, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but we got this um, film coming out. The King Rocker movie was coming out in 2020. So we more or less took 2019 off with the kind of, oh, we've got a film coming out, we've got a new album coming out. You know, we'll make 2020 the big year where we really sort of go for it. And then... Uh, that was kiboshed, so um, it felt like we squandered an extra year more than we needed to by, um, you know, by taking 2019 off. I'm going to talk more about the movie shortly. I'm going to talk about the tour that's coming up as well. You join us in Manchester in April. But first of all, if we can go back to the beginning, uh, you formed the band The Nightingales back in 1979. Then you had, you know, the 80s were massive for you. You had John Peel behind you. And it's safe to say the band The Nightingales had quite a big cult status. What was life like? like for you back then in the 80s i enjoyed making the music and um as you say there was there was more interest in, in sort of independent music then i think than there is than the, there is now or at least we sold a lot more records so yeah i was um i was playing regularly and making records regularly as you mentioned peel was a great champion of the band so um so life was pretty good and i was obviously a lot younger then as well so i could sort of uh, you know enjoy it a bit more um you you were a big cult band and like you say you had you know many people behind you the likes of John Peel where did your influences come from when you first started the Nightingales well originally because I'd been in a band called the Prefects before the Nightingales which was sort of a punk rock group but I soon got disillusioned with the punk thing and was I I was more interested in, in sort of more avant-garde music, I suppose, like the German bands and Captain Beefheart and, uh, to a certain extent, the Mothers of Invention and Velvet Underground and stuff. That was where my influences came from, but the people I was working with were more sort of into rock music, I suppose. So it was like a, a hybrid of my kind of queer tastes and their more sort of standard rock kind of thing, you know. That's what made the band interesting, and it was great as well, such a mixture of influences. You had a great time in the 80s then in the late 1980s you called it a day and then you ended up getting back together and reforming the band in 2004 how did that come about at what made the reunion happen well um when the band sort of fell apart in the the mid to late 80s i my wife at the time was up the duff with my son and so i needed to actually do some work and try and make um, make some money and um and we also moved to london where she was a southern woman and seemed like a good idea at the time so i was do, i did various jobs in london like postman and um and then a guy called james brown who was the editor of gq magazine at the time gave me some work writing and i i got involved with some fellas making pop videos for a, uh, for a bit and that was all well and good but it wasn't um, I wasn't doing anything creative and I was sort of losing losing the way a bit really so I moved back to the Midlands and to cut a long story short someone offered some money to for the Nightingales to get to back together and do a one-off gig so I rustled up some of the old guard and we um, and we did this sort of mercenary performance but I, find, I found that I enjoyed it and I was I was willing to write songs again so um, I sort of kept a, a, a unit together and despite the fact that quite a lot of musicians came and went during the course of it I knew that I, that it was the stuff I was writing was good and that I was back into it and and so just kept kept at it really until I eventually got um, you know a regular 
a band you know, that we could make records with and tour with and feel comfortable with. And that's where we are now. I'm going to talk more about the tour in a minute as well. I want to talk about the last album you brought as well, Four Against Fate. But one thing you mentioned at the beginning of the interview was the, the documentary King Rocket, which you were pretty much the subject of. How did that come about? Well, originally it was a, it was Phil Jupiter, who's a sort of Nightingales fan. And he'd suggested um, that maybe we'd, the BBC might want to do a documentary on the band. As has become apparent, that never came to fruition. But one one day I was in the pub with Stuart Lee and I told him about this idea of a documentary. And I was going, oh, it'd be really funny. We should just, you know, do it as a sort of like the world's unluckiest band and make a bit of a gag out of it. <laughs> and Stuart was going, no, you shouldn't... Um, you shouldn't make a joke out of it. You're too good for it to be just like a, a farce. And I was, I thought, oh, yeah, fair enough. But anyway, nothing came of it anyway, and I forgot all about it. Then in 2019, I got a phone call from Stuart, and he, he was saying, you know that documentary you were talking about? I've met a director, and I've got a, I've also met a film producer who were interested in doing it. Would you, do you want to do it? Obviously, it was a bit of a no-brainer, because I thought, well, if it's going to get the... Um, the Nightingale's music out to more people. I've always had this impression, and I might be misguided, I've no idea, but um, I've always had this kind of thought that if people got to hear the Nightingales, we'd be quite popular. <laughs> well, back, <laughs> in the age, a- you know, back in the day, everybody loved the Nightingales and, you know, people people that were important and respected, the likes of John Peel, got right behind you. You're right, but it's... it's it did seem to have gone off the rails, you know, and we were, you know, a lot of younger bands had come along and, and were sort of, um, I don't know, I guess we didn't look the part or sound the part. I, I I can't explain it. But either way, even even if we were quite popular, the idea of a film gave us the chance to sort of get through to more people. And I had this impression that if more people heard the music, more people would like it and uh, the only way would be forwards, you know. So I agreed to do the documentary and um, didn't really know what it was going to end tail sort of out of a comfort zone for a lot of it because i'm not i don't know who, who likes having a camera in their face all the time you know but i knew that michael and stuart were sort of serious you know they'd done some seriously good work before so i trusted them and um i worked on the level that if it was if it was successful i could kind of go oh yeah that's that film's about me and if it was um, a flop i could go well they made the film, I was just the subject of it, you know, and um, I could pass the book on it kind of thing. But lo and behold, it got made um, and it went down a stormer. It helped to sell a few records and a few tickets. And um, Am I right in oh, thinking a soundtrack got released off it as well? As well yeah, as l- l- yeah, last Friday, actually, it came out as um, a, a DVD with um, a bunch of extras and a CD of the soundtrack. Or there's a vinyl 12-inch of the, of the soundtrack as well. They both came out last Friday through Fire Records. who It was Fire Films who put the money up to do the movie in the first place. I've obviously not seen it yet, but I am really looking forward to seeing it because you're one of them bands, I think, that intrigue a lot of people. I think that's one of the reasons why everyone loves you. Talking about music, though, your last studio album, which I think was your 11th studio album, Fought Against Fate, that came out in 2020 as well. How did you feel about that album? Do you feel your influences have changed much over the years? Um, well, I've always been open-minded. I like all kinds of music. And I'm also, um, I work with other people and I'm not one of these sorts of, you know, dictators. I, I do, um, I am interested in in letting the musicians express themselves rather than, you know, I'm not someone who just tells them what to do. I love that. Yeah, yeah. well, so do I. Potentially we could do anything, you know what I mean? If someone, if, if someone came along with a reggae song or a heavy metal song, and it was good enough, then we'd do it. You know, it's not, we're not limited with our outlook of of what we'll do. And Four Against Fate, I always think of them, I mean, this is partly to do with the lyrics, I suppose, but I always think of an album as a kind of diary, you know, it's like what I'm, what's going on at that particular time in my life is what you what you get into here and four against fate a lot of people thought it was the best album we've we've ever done but we have recorded another one since and i think that's better really <laughs> so that's yeah, but that's not even out, you know, that won't be out for some time yet. Um, I was going to ask you about that. I'm going to play one of my favourite tracks off the Four Against Fate album in a minute, but uh, when what about new music? That was going to be one of my questions. Can we expect anything soon? Yeah, there'll be something very soon, a single. The, the album will be... Tw- 
probably towards the end of the year, I suppose. But as you may or may not know, there's a real backlog at the pressing plants. So, um, you know, things that would normally take a few months to turn over are now taking like double the amount of time and... Um, I keep hearing about that. A lot of unsigned bands that I know have kind of like had records produced and, you know, sold all the, they've done all the pre-orders and sold them and it's ended up being three, four, five months down the line before they can send them out. Yeah, because um, the sort of bigger labels, they buy up time, even if they've gotten, even if there's no specific record that they want to press, they buy up time so that as and when they've got something, they can just get it done. So for the smaller bands, like the, the kind of bands you're talking about, or even the Nightingales kind of thing, um, you get pushed to the back of the queue. The, the idea of recording a record, say say I was recording a record today, and you'd think, oh, I'll have that out in um, June. And it's like, you'd be lucky to get it out by Christmas. You know, that's the, that's the way it is at the moment. Mad so, really, isn't it? Well, we yeah. will look forward to more new music as and when we can get it. But obviously one of the things we want to talk about is the fact that in a couple of weeks' time, uh, you start a pretty big... Big UK tour. It starts in Glasgow on the 19th of April. You go to Liverpool, Darlington, Leeds, Norwich, Oxford, Winchester, Brighton, Birmingham, Bristol, London, Leek, Hebden Bridge and Nottingham. But you're with us in Manchester on Saturday the 23rd of April at the Deaf Institute, which is a great, great venue. Uh, what can people expect on this tour? Is it going to be old stuff, new stuff, mixture? There's no real, there's no old 80s stuff, I don't think. Um, I mean, to be honest, we've just started rehearsing uh, um, for the tour and I suppose we, we're still kind of sorting out what the set will be but there'll be stuff from Four Against Fate a few things that we've written since Four Against Fate and then like a kind of little selection from um, the previous the previous records the, normally there might be one or two sort of old you know from the 80s kind of numbers but I'm not sure about this this tour yet but either way we do every song kind of runs into the next one so it's just like um, um, it's almost like one piece that lasts an hour. There's no there's no breaks or no chit chat or any of that kind of stuff. It's just um, a, a solid hour's worth of stuff. Have you played We've the got... Deaf Institute before? I haven't. No, I've I've been told by Mark Riley that it's the best venue in Manchester. It's a great venue, and I feel like the old surroundings and vibe of the place will really fit in with your music. So I'm going to try my hardest to get to that gig because yeah, well, dude, yeah, it'd be good. Um, it'd be good to see you, Dave, and and. It, It'd be good for you to see us. I tell yeah, you, we're, definitely. Um, it's definitely we're, someone I want to come to. In my personal opinion, we're, we're much better as a live a, a live thing than we are on record, really. Even, even though the records are, pr- are pretty good, <laughs> live is a different um, thing altogether, I think. We, it's a, a kind of mighty show. I've never and seen you got, live, but I've known your music over the years, so definitely need to get to that gig. Well, I think we're better. I genuinely think we're better now than, than this than any Nightingales have been in the past. It's uh, the the three musicians I've got are all you know they're dedicated to it, and it's I'm really I'm really pleased with it. Yeah, we've got my old mate um, Ted Chippington is supporting us. I don't know if you know his stuff. He's like a comedian of sorts. And then there's a Dutch band called Rats on Rafts who are also on the bill. They sound pretty interesting as well. The, the Deaf Institute. I've heard so many good things about it, and we've never been there before. So uh, hopefully it'll be good. Yeah, you'll love it. And like I say, the music, what you're doing, everything, I do think it'll proper fit in with the surroundings and stuff. Uh, so the Nightingales play in Manchester at the Deaf Institute, Saturday the 23rd of April. Uh, remaining tickets are available now through all the usual outlets. Uh, but Robert Lloyd, it's been an absolute privilege and pleasure meeting you and talking to you today. Thank you so much for joining us. No, it's been a pleasure, Dave. And um, hopefully if you can get to the Deaf Institute, uh, come and say hello. I will do, definitely. And yeah, keep in touch. So, yeah. Massive thank you to Robert Lloyd. And this is one of my favourite singles of the band's last album, For Against Fate. Uh, this is the top shelf. A massive thank you to Robert Lloyd of the Nightingales once again. All right. Take care, Dave.